Welcome back everyone to the second part of the lecture. In the first part, we talked about the properties and characteristics and main features of the wireless physical channel that can help facilitate the application and the implementation of physical air security. We also talked about the impairments and impairments that are caused usually by the wireless channel. These impairments include noise, fading, interference, dispersion, dispersion in time, in frequency, like doubler, and even in angle. When you have multiple antennas, we call it angle dispersion. All these impairments can be, although they are impairments from the perspective of providing reliability and providing higher data rates, but usually they are really useful in security because if you can just direct these impairments and make sure they harm the eavesdropper but not the legitimate receiver then you are ensuring a secure communication system at the physical layer now as you know physical air security domain is really huge massive there are hundreds even thousands of paper of papers available on the literature specifically on 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 topics like designing in new techniques in new methods in new approaches in new schemes in new designs that can help significantly improve the physical layer security uh, performance at the physical layer some of these papers are uh, discussing security without any regard to encryption some are combining them with encryption, some are coming with different approaches. And we have so many papers that at the end of the day, if you just go and uh, if you just want to learn physical air security by yourself and go to the field without uh, having any guideline or any uh, any mentorship or any guidance, you will be lost. So to, to facilitate the process of learning physical air security for beginners who have no idea about physical air security and we, they want to reach from the beginner level to the expert level. We, we wrote a paper, me with my friends and my advisor, previous advisor, about physical air security. This paper is a comprehensive survey that discusses and summarizes more than 460 papers around this number, or more, more than 400 papers. So all these papers are summarized to you. And not only summarized, we classified them. We just looked at all the available techniques on the literature and we divided them into categories so that we make it easier for researchers and people after us to learn, study, and extend on top of that. To know the draw, to know the limitations of each technique, to know the possibilities, to know the impossibilities, to know the advantages, the disadvantages of each and every domain, what to know the future directions, what else researchers can do in the future, to know what techniques what techniques can really provide security without any reliance on cryptography to know what are the techniques that are not good to be used alone. All these and others and even lessons learned from the literature are all in that paper. Uh, I, we spent significant amount of time writing this paper, improving it, reading papers, understanding the literature until we covered everything possible. We can, we, we just, we just did, we tried our best to make it as easy as possible for beginners and we discussed it from a simple perspective not information theory perspective but rather signal processing perspective and the practical perspective so that we make it even uh, easier for the industry to understand this domain and they try if they are interested in implementing or adopting physical air security technique with their devices they can easily just go over this paper so this paper you don't need anymore to go and serve the literature thousands of papers and get lost there you just can grab this paper and enjoy it it's not a paper it's a book like it's 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 so huge that that we, if we want to write it in a form of a book it will be more than 125 pages 130 but it's compressed in small small line font a small font size with a, with about like 56 pages double column pages with a font size of 9 or or less i believe 
And so, so imagine the huge amount of information and the things with it. So in this paper titled the classification and applications of physical air security techniques for confidentiality, a comprehensive survey, it presents an inclusive tutorial and survey that can help solidify and deepen the understanding of the big picture of physical air security. From the, 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 from the very beginning, from the very basic, you can understand things step by step. Particularly, the paper comprehensively classifies the existing physical air security techniques against wireless passive dropping into fundamental domains. These domains, we explain them, the three domains, coding domain, the adaptation domain and optimization, and uh, artificial signal injection, and secret key generation. These are the four main branches of physical air security. For each domain, several examples are given and illustrated along with reviewing the most recent security advances. Moreover, moreover the lessons learned, advantages and disadvantages of each technique are discussed to give an insight on the trade-off among security and other communication requirements, the trade-off between security and reliability. What's the relationship between them? If you increase reliability, would that affect security? If you increase security, would that affect the data rate? Would that affect the robot? How they interact with each other? What are the, the, what are the, the effect of their uh, of their change on each other. The paper then reviews and discusses the recent applications of physical air techniques into emerging technologies such as just count, visible light communication. We studied the implementation of physical air security on visible light communication, which we call it Li-Fi, not Wi-Fi, Li-Fi. Body area network, internet of thing, uh, uh, Power line communication, smart grid, millimeter wave, cognitive radio, vehicular ad hoc network, VANET, UAVs, drones in the sky, ultra wide band, device to device communication, RFID, index modulation, 5G normal systems, and others. All these, we surveyed the papers related to these domains and we explained the challenges, the advantages, disadvantages, and what other things can be done. The paper finally concludes with the recommendations and the future research direction, directions for designing robust, strong security methods for current and the future wireless systems. So this is a brief summary of the paper. I hope you are excited by now by knowing the stuff that's covered in this paper and the things in there. So you just need to hover, go over this link, click on the link, you will be directed to the PDF version of that paper. You download it and you read it and you try to, cover, to read as much as you can from there if you are interested to becoming a very good security engineer. So I will ask some questions from it as well. Basically the stuff I covered in the lecture, but I recommend everybody. There are few papers, three to four papers. I want everybody to read them. This is one of them. Because, you know, in lecture, sometimes we miss some of the details. We cannot explain everything. In, we, 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 it's, it's so so big and so massive, and there are so many deep technical details and insights that we sometimes forget to talk about. So if you want to get full comprehensive understanding of this whole concept called physical air security, you need to be, read papers, read books, read articles, recent published articles in journals. And this paper is good in the sense that it summarizes these papers for you and it just gives you an insight and makes you really good in this domain by just reading one paper instead of being confused and jumping from one, one domain to another, one part to another. So that's the beauty and the advantage and the edge that this paper has over the other papers. Now, the information transmission. Before... To, to, to design physical air security techniques that are really robust and strong, you need to understand the information transmission process. And if you remember at the beginning of the lecture, I, I showed you uh, a picture that shows the physical layer design and how complex it is and uh, many lines, many blocks, many this, that. 
So the, the, this is kind of simple visualization of the process of transmitting your data. Because if you if you understand deeply how data is being transmitted, you will be able to understand how to how to hack this data, how to maybe you will get an understanding and you will get some sense of how an eavesdropper can really get your data. And if you get that sense, if you get that understanding, you will after that, you will be able to design techniques that you can claim are secure and uh, protected against eavesdropping. But if you don't understand how the communication system works and how the data is being uh, is transmitted and is formed, then how, how how do you how do you think you can design a secure system? How do you think your system is really secure from an attacker? How do you think nobody can access your data that you transmitted to your friend? So first, you need to understand how the data is transmitted, then understand uh, what are the the, what are the breaches and uh, gaps that an eavesdropper can exploit to get the data? And then your goal is to make sure that the eavesdropper can, cannot, cannot hack these things or cannot really make use of them. So basically, though, in the wireless transmission, you have you have the signal domain. You have uh, two domains: the message domain and the signal domain. Message space and signal space, we call it. Yes. Where is the message space? This is the message space. This is before modulation. And everybody knows modulation. We explained modulation in several lectures before I have some detailed videos on my YouTube channel explaining modulation. You can go back and watch those to understand exactly modulation. But basically modulation is the process of mapping your messages from the if your data from the message space to the signal space. So what, what does this mean? So your message is you have bits, yes? And these bits, you convert them to complex numbers. And then you, you, you these, the, the, these data symbols or bits, you map them to a signal space where you have different dimensions. You have, di you have the dimension of time, the dimension of frequency, the dimension of space, the dimension maybe of code, the dimension of power. You have several dimensions. We call it the electrostat of the signal. You have a signal. You have a symbol. You have an info. You want to send it. At which frequency you want to send it? At which time slot? From which antenna? In which direction? What would be the power? Which code spreading you will use? All these are critical details that determine where your signal is located. For an eavesdropper to be able to detect your signal, he has to know all this information. If the eavesdropper is not aware of this information or he doesn't have this knowledge, he will not be able to even synchronize with your data, not even try to decode synchronize. So the, this is so critical. Yes, I understand. We many times, sometimes we assume that the eavesdropper uh, has no problem in this. We assume the eavesdropper has access to the data. He knows the frequency. He knows the time slot. He knows the direction. He knows the power. He knows every. But that's not practical because the eavesdropper is passive sometimes, and those parameters are not necessarily need to be defined in the standard. A transmitter can adopt them, adjust them, modify them according to the needs of the legitimate receiver. So now you have you have the signal space and you transmit over the channel. And the channel causes distortion. The distortion is caused by the impairments I just mentioned to you in the previous part of the lecture, where we said we have the noise, the fading, the interference, the dispersion in time, the dispersion in frequency. We have the the dispersion in angle, angular domain, and we have some other phenomena as well. So, 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 so what's the job of an eavesdropper to be able to detect this or decode this or get access to the message? First, he needs to 
to intercept to, 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 to he needs the message to be within the coverage within certain box we call it the coverage box the eavesdropper which means that the eavesdropper needs to know the frequency that the transmitter uses at which frequency he's transmitting which time slot in which direction what's the power so that he can determine this box you see this box here this little bo box here if the eavesdropper is not concentrating only on measuring the signal on this box, he will not be able to even lock to your signal or even be able to, de to start decoding or guessing or doing uh, exhaustive search attack or anything like this. So the, it's very critical, very important that uh, eavesdropper at least know, know, at least get to know this box in terms of the signal. Then after that, the interception process. What's the interception process? The ability to determine the modulation type, which modulation the transmitter sends, which which uh, which subcarrier spacing in the OFDM, how many carriers, what's the IFFT size, what's the FFT size, what's uh, the duration of the CB, all what's the power level, what's the uh, the optimization technique, the, the scheduling technique, all these are critical information as well that needs to be known to the eavesdropper so that the eavesdropper can, can start uh, having the ability of decoding the message. Then after this, the detection, you need to detect, yes, you need to detect your signal. What if the transmitter is using spreading codes and your signal, yes, there is signal, but the signal is below the noise level. How can you detect it? How can you see it? You, you you are synchronized. You are looking at your signal in the spectrum analyzer, but you are not seeing anything. You are just see noise. Where is the signal? You don't know the signal in, in below the noise. So you need to also to be able to detect to see the signal above the noise level. And then final version is exploitation. You get you, you get to know after you get to know all this information. Now you can decode and start doing the exhaustive search process if you want to hack the data. Basically, most of the physical air security techniques forget this. Usually, they, 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 this is not sometimes considered, which is unfortunate because this is practical. And they just go directly here and they say, you just transmitted the signal and you have an observation now. Uh, how how can you de how can you decode the message from the signal space directly? So this is this is not really the whole picture. But now we will go and focus only on this part, which is mostly what the other papers, most of the papers on the literature are focusing on. You have a received signal. You assume you are within the coverage. You have no problem. You have all the side information regarding modulation, number, power, all this. You're just interested in the data itself. And let's see what what the system model that's being adopted in the literature to study this, this problem. So here we just delete this. So here, here are the stages of the overall reception mechanism at the eavesdropper. The eavesdropper uh, has to go through the coverage phase, then the detection phase, the coverage phase, the detection phase. This is phase one, phase two, the detection, phase three, interception, phase four, exploitation. And the meaning of them, the coverage, we we just explained it. You you know the time window, the time slot, you know the frequency band, the bandwidth, the coverage area, the direction, the power, all these details. The detection, you need to detect the power of the signal, energy detection. You need to ha use spectrum sensing technique to know that there is a signal and be able to see, focus on that signal. Feature extraction, interception it is to know the modulation, number of carriers, filters, filters, parameters like the alpha factor. You know, we use sometimes raised cosine. We need to know the alpha, how much spreading in the filter, what's the shape of the filter, number of carriers, the I50 size, the spreading code. And then the exploitation when you start decoding your message and demodulating and decoding, basically you try to get your message from the signal domain to the message domain 
And for this, to evaluate the performance, you use metrics like the bit error rate, the security rate, the security gap, and so on and so forth. So these are the four main requirements which an eavesdropper should already satisfy or attain via additional algorithms in order to have successful reception, to start having the successful, successful reception. So now, now, assuming that we reach this exploitation level, so what's the system model? The system model, we explained it. You have your message and you have encoder, and the, 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 the signal goes through diff two different channels. You, since you have two different receivers, pop and E, one signal goes to the box channel, which is main channel, sometimes we call it, and eavesdropper channel, which is the eaves channel. And you have a decoder and uh, at both sides, the, po the receiver pop and the receiver eve. And eve is the bad guy. It, eve is the bad guy. We want to make sure that he does not get our signal and the signal can go only to Bob without being disclosed to Eve. Although Eve can have access to it because it's a wireless channel and you are broadcasting your signal in all the directions. So now you see that I used the variables here, M, X. So M is the message before the encoder and X is the signal after the encoder. And RB is the received signal, received signal at Bob, and M is the message again, but estimated at Bob, because you know the message, go, the signal goes through channel and noise, and you need to estimate this. And the estimation is always, always not perfect, it has some errors. We call it erroreness. And therefore, we put the hat on top of the message here. You, you try to get M from the observation, RP or RE. Now, let me just give you another uh, system model that much better than this one or easier to understand with variables. And we are going to uh, use different variables to, to give you the, the, to give you the, the sense that it's not necessarily to use the same variables. You can use any terms, any variables you want. And you, as long as you are meaning the same thing. So here, here we have Alice, we have Bob, we have Eve, and we have the encoder and modulator, and we have the demodulator and decoder at Bob and Eve. So we represent the message here, the source information with W, W, and then it goes through the modulator. We have X now. X is the signal that we are going to transmit over the wireless channel. It goes through the main, the eavesdropper, this and that. So here, let's agree on the variable meanings. Uh, let's assume W is the message signal. X is the signal after encoding and modulating. And then we have at the receiver after the channel, we have Y, B. B stands for Bob and Y is the received signal. What's, can, you, can you write Y for me? Y, B is equal to the channel channel of pop, let's say H, B, multiplied by X, this is X, plus, plus noise, noise at B. So this is the mathematical model of this line, this line. And we have another line related to Eve, you just replace B with E, it becomes for Eve, and you have two, two models. And your goal here is to get X only at the legitimate receiver pop and prevent Eve from getting this X. So this is in mathematical meaning. Now let's, let's continue and see what does, this, what does this mean in information theoretic perspective. So in information theoretic perspective, what's the goal? We explained the goal from mathematical modeling perspective that we just want Bob to get X perfectly and we want to prevent Eve from getting anything. But how do you, how do you study this from mathematical point of view? So here we have something we call in the information theory, mutual information at Bob. 
So the mutual information is the amount of information that both can receive successfully, reliably, we say, without any errors. And we, we denote this by uh, I, W, semicolon, YP, which means this is the mutual information. And basically, at the legitimate receiver bulb, you want to increase this as much as possible. Because the more you increase it, the better the reliability will be and the, the, the higher number of data bits you can send and receive. Whereas at the eavesdropper, we want to, in, to increase the entropy, which is denoted by H, the entropy of the message W, given the observation at the eavesdropper, the observation of the signal at the eavesdropper, denoted by YE. And you want to increase this term as much as possible. What's the ideal case? The ideal case is to have the entropy. Entropy is the, if, if you got information theory course in your undergrad, the entropy is the amount of uncertainty about the message signal. So ideally, higher the entropy, the higher the amount of information. And so, so in ideal case, if you want your system to be really ideally secure, you want the entropy of the message given the observation of Eve to be exactly equal to the entropy of the message itself, which means that the uncertainty of Eve guessing the message W, assuming he has full access to the signal observation YE, is exactly equal to the entropy of the message itself, which means to the uncertainty of the message itself, and this means that the mutual information at Eve will go to zero, which is I. And this is the perfect case. This term, the entropy of W conditioned on YE, is called the equivocation at Eve, mathematically. So this is the goal the, in terms of math notation and and from information theoretic perspective. Now, of course, you can map this to signal to noise ratio. You can map this to bit error rate. You can map this to other performance metrics, but this is how the information the theory papers study the physical air security problem. Basically, they, they, they study what's possible to be done. And then after that, the engineers and the other res the practical researchers come after them and they they try to come up with the practical techniques that can achieve what the information theorists uh, claimed and uh, predicted using math. So they just set the limits and they they understand how much it can it, how much uh, secrecy rate can be achieved and what would be the throughput and this and that and they put limits and uh, conditions and then the engineers and the practical experts they come and they try to come up with the practical methods techniques schemes design whatever you want to call them and uh, the aim is to make sure that these can achieve what the information theory predicts so now, and of course, if you make any mistake and you go beyond the limit, you know that this is not possible. So here I showed you this figure before in which we classified the existing techniques. This figure briefly, explain, uh, briefly explains the domain of physical air security and the classification advantages, disadvantages. We already explained it before. I'm not going to go over these two figures one more time and the secrecy metrics. So I'm going to go directly to how the practical engineers, the practical experts measure the security. Not they, they don't use usually mutual information, mutual information and and those metrics that I showed you in this slide, they don't use these normally. They use more practical measures like bit error rate, signal to noise ratio, packet error rate, probability of error, and this and that. They, there is a term, a metric called security gap. Security gap uh, is used by, by 
by those who design practical schemes in while in physical air security. And the, the, the meaning of it is to have enough gap in terms of bit error rate or signal to noise ratio between the legitimated transmitter and eavesdropper so that the eavesdropper can can uh, can receive his signal successfully why Eve cannot and what's the meaning of this gap let's 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 just draw uh, a system model basic system model with a base station and two users one of them is Eve and the other is legitimate so let's see what can we do here so here we have the base station and here we have two users So this is user one, and this is user two. And let's assume that user two is Eve, and user one is what? User one is Pop, and you have your signal is coming in all the directions. So basically, since uh, since the Smith user Pop is closer to the base station. Automatically, usually in most cases, if we don't have severe fading, the signal to noise ratio will be higher here. Which means that the signal to noise ratio of this user, it will be this signal to noise ratio. At the, it, it will be the, la the larger signal to noise ratio, more power compared to noise, because it's closer to the base station, the distance is lower and therefore the degradation in the power of the signal is less and accordingly the signal to noise ratio is higher whereas this user since this user is really far from the base station the signal to noise ratio will be really less than the previous signal to noise ratio and for this let's use another color and take this here and map it to this signal to noise ratio so the, the, the distance a user that's really far from the base station can be mapped to this signal to noise ratio. Now, just take vertical lines from these points, vertical lines, until you hit the bit error rate curve. And tell me what's the bit error rate here. So let's say any value here. We are giving it a variable name, which means it can be any value. But let's say this is 10 to minus 1. And for for this guy who's closer to the base station, when you when you take a vertical line here and then map a horizontal line from it, you will hit the BE max. And let's say this is 10 to minus four. Yes. So. So so the secure. Well, what's the security gap here then? So the security gap is basically the difference in the signal to noise ratio between this the 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 legitimate receiver in in red and the eavesdropper in blue and we we say that there is a gap of if if we say that this is 30 db and this 10 db we say that there is about 20 db difference 20 db uh, amount of gap between Pop and Eve, uh, which means that, which means that, at the time, at the time where the legitimate receiver is receiving a signal to noise ratio of about 30 dB and getting bit error rate of 10 to minus 4, the eavesdropper at the same time getting an SNR of about 10 dB and bit error rate of about 10 to minus 1. Suppose you are sending a voice communication, a voice service, or a video. Do you think Eve will be able to decode that successfully? The, the short answer is no. He cannot decode it because he, his signal-to-noise ratio is so low that makes his bit error rate terrible. And he cannot decode it. And uh, uh, while at the same time the eavesdropper 
the listmate receiver is successful in receiving it because voice service requires a bit of rate lower than 10 to minus 2 and he's having or experiencing 10 to minus 4 which is awesome great he's below the threshold below the required bit error rate and we call this scenario is secure now one might ask the following question okay you assume that eve is the far user from the base station but why don't you assume that eve has the same distance from the base station just as the legitimate receiver pulp so in this case uh, how would we achieve security so in this case we say security one of the main fundamental requirements of physical air security is to have an advantage a favorable advantage in terms of the signal to noise ratio with respect to the legitimate receiver over that with respect to the eavesdropper if you cannot if you cannot have this advantage you, you you will not be able to have security at the physical layer usually usually unless you use some other techniques that uses secret key generation and this and that and exploit fading maybe but like this is the main assumption of physical layer security so so this means that this is not really very useful in practice because i can I, i'm not i'm not i cannot be sure where eve is located I can I can consider this only if Eve is far and this automatically will be secure. I don't need to implement or do anything. In this case, when Eve, when Eve, let's put the other scenario. Yes, let's delete this and put the other scenario where we have base station here and we have two users and both users, those users, they are, they have the same distance from the base station more or less and you want to secure them. You want to secure the list mate, the list mate user from the eavesdropper. Yes. And so how do you do that? So let's the 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 red one is Bob and the blue is Eve. This is Eve. How do you do that? You you just So in this case, the physical air security says that you need to have a better signal to noise ratio at the legitimate receiver Bob compared to Eve. But now the channel itself, in terms of distance, says that both they have the same distance. So how can you how can you make sure that Bob can really have an advantage over Eve? You have two ways to solve this problem. The first the first solution is to is to exploit something we call fading. Now in wireless we know that two users can be at at the same distance away from the base station, but they can experience different channels. We know this. Since they experience different channels, so the response of Bob let's say the, the response of eve will be something like this this is the channel of e uh, this is the channel of eve let's write eve and the 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 channel of bob the channel of bob let's say is something like this this is bob and as you can see Although they have the same path loss, but they have different fadings. What I mean by fading, fading is when the channel response is low. So look at Bob, for example, in the first part, just look at this part. Look at this part from here to here, from the beginning to here, and look at this part. So what do you see in this part? You see that Eve has a better channel than Bob which means that if you send any signal eve will receive it with a better quality than bob which means that you cannot secure any information you send over this channel over this time slot over this duration or this band whatever it can be any resource however however look at this duration so 
So the signal here at Eve in deep fade, which means that whatever you send to Eve, it will be multiplied by something like O0001. So it's like suppressing the signal. The signal will be when it gets multiplied by this number. If you have 10, if you have 100, it will become like one. You are suppressing the signal. Whereas here at the top, if your signal, you will multiply your signal. If it is five, you will multiply it 10 times. It becomes 50. It's the channel is amplifying your received signal. So at that point, at that moment, when your channel response is better at the legitimate receiver compared to if you send your signal, you send your data. At that point, you don't need to do anything. You just send at the times or in the situations where your where the channel of the legitimate receiver is much better than the channel of the eavesdropper. This is we call it fading, exploiting fading or or just the variation or the random in the random instantaneous variation of the channel in order to provide and send or extract security. So now we have case one. We have case one. We we exploited bath loss. Bath loss and bath loss exploits distance. And we have case two where we exploited what? We exploited fading. So fading, although fading is a foe, an enemy for us in in signal reception, we don't like fading because it degrades our signal, but it turns out that fading is good for security. Yes? So it can help us uh, send some secret information, some like it's like you can send, let's say, in kilobit per second, kilobyte per, per second, amount of secret information. This secret information, you can use it as a key between the transmitter and receiver, which is good. I mean, it's nice, practical, it can happen, and uh, even it can solve the problem where even Bob can have the same scenario. So we, for case one, we needed that we needed to have a significant distance difference between Bob and Eve, yes? So that Bob can have a better signal-to-noise ratio. And this is natural, something coming from nature. Uh, the, the user that's farther from the base station will get worse signal-to-noise ratio and accordingly worse with error rate. The, the, the second case is when we have two users at the same distance from the base station and we said that the bath loss will not help us in this case. And the only way to exploit, to provide security or to send some secret information to the listener is to, to look and see the, these moments of the channel where you have better channel response at the, at the legitimate receiver compared to Eve. And we explained this, yes? So now let's look at case three. Case three, basically, when you have what? Case three is when you so case three is basically when you have when you have this Eve Eve is much closer to the base station. What will you do? Yes. Let, Let's assume that let's delete this. So here, Eve, we need to draw another line for Eve and assume that he's closer to the base station. And what will you do in this scenario? So here, Eve. So in this case, we need uh, the, the nature, the nature, the wireless channel will not help us. We don't have path loss difference. Even if we have fading, fading, even uh, the case of fading will not help us much because you, now your, your receiver, usually I'm not saying not all, most of the times fading will not help too much now because you have a better received signal due to having shorter distance. So even if you have fading, fading happens 
like over a, a, a small variation in the amplitude around the mean, which is the, like you ha you have you have uh, you have the loss due to the distance, something like this, and you have the variation over it, something like this, due to fading. So even if you even if you have fading, but you are still you have you have very good SNR due to being closer to the base station, and this fading, this slight variation around uh, this region, let's say this region, the variation around here, they are not significant compared to someone here at this point. It's the, your, your signal to noise ratio in the red region is lower even if your fading is better. Why? Because this user, the black one, is closer to the base station and his SNR due to path loss is really good. I mean, he's very close, the distance is not much. And even if there is variation, even if there is fading, the fading happens within within a certain mean around within the the the, the path loss mean which is happening due to distance so what's the solution here what's the solution you, you you tell me what can i do here in this case if the nature does not help us remember this rule you need to make something artificial yes nature helps us sometimes inherently that it has cases where auto automatically, spontaneously, it's favoring us, it's working with us, helping us making achieving what we want. But sometimes it's not helping us. It's we are in a situation in a, in a case where Eve is closer to the base station than Pop. What are you gonna do? This is the moment where you need to invent, invent and innovate, come up with new techniques, with new methods that can ensure this. And if your method can work for the third case, it can work for all the other cases, because this is the worst case scenario. Your security technique is designed for this case. So now let me give you two examples of how we can solve this problem. The first solution. So let's delete everything here. And let's draw again. We have we have the base station, and we have we have two users. We have this base stations, and we have two users. We have Eve, and we have Bob. Bob in red, Eve in blue. And as you can see, Bob is farther from the base station compared to Eve. So here we have the communication link with respect to Bob. And we have this communication link with respect to Eve. Yes. So now we know that the SNR at Eve is better. And if you don't do anything, he will be able to get his data. Uh, he will be able to listen and spy on Bob. So what can you do? I told you, get innovative. Be smart. Now it's time to be smart. The previous two cases were nature. You just need to discover them. But now you need to invent. Nature is not in your side anymore now. One solution is to, you know, the concept of beam forming. And and instead of sending your signal, let, let's let's draw this for you. Usually, how how we send our signal? We send our signal in an omnidirectional case like this. Our signals goes in all the direction. But what if instead of sending your signal in all the directions and make it the same for both users, you just beamform your signal? beamform your signal just towards your receiver and make sure that Eve does not receive anything. There is no beams pointing towards Eve. So this is kind of limiting the coverage of Eve. 
Yes, Eve is closed, but you just what? You do what? You just send your signal in the direction of Pop. You track where is Pop, where Pop is, and you narrow your beam. You make your beam. You focus all your energy. The whole energy you focus it just within very narrow beam towards the direction of Pop. So what will happen here? You will get a beam like this. Instead of an omnidirectional transmission, you will get a beam like this. OK, so this beam. Now you have this beam. Just focused only on the direction of Bob and Eve is not getting anything, assuming that for the for the ideal case. However, Eve is usually close to the we assume in this case that Eve is closer to the base station. And in practical system, in practical system, Eve can get access to the data, to the information, if from the side loops. If you studied side loops from the antenna cores, there is always side loops. Well, what does the side loop mean? mean uh, you, yes, true, you have main beam, which is directed towards pop, but also you have some side loops and some leakage information leakage and Eve, if Eve uh, reception capability is strong and he's close enough to the base station, he can get the data from from the side loops. So what's the solution to this problem? So we we may we 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 explain to you the solution where you can use PIM forming and narrow your PIM, make it narrow enough so that the signal can be only seeable and uh, detectable only within the within the direction of Bob. But if Eve is closer, he can get it from from the side loops. So to solve this problem, we have a technique called in the literature called directional modulation. So directional modulation DM di directional modulation on top of beam forming your signal, you 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 manipulate the phase of the transmitted signal in a certain way so that it can only the constellation of the the constellation diagram can only be meaningful at the legitimate receiver while the constellations will be making not a, no sense at the at, in the direction of eve especially those uh, those side loops that eve is getting the signal from so this is the solution for this problem directional modulation now now uh, okay we understand we have been forming we have directional modulation now let's let's make things more complex and let's uh, assume that eve is somehow even pop they, they are very close to each other and you cannot separate you cannot really direct beams in a direction of one and you, you you make sure that Eve does not get any signal and in this case Eve will be, will become here let's say Eve is here Let, let's draw Eve again Eve moved here Eve is living in the beam of is living in the beam of Bob so now now this is really tough now what can we do here Eve is closer to the base station and he's exactly in the middle between the transmitter and receiver. He's really getting the coverage. He's really getting the signal, the main beam. So what do you do then? So you do the following. So we have we have something called artificial signals injection. So in this case, you 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 design, you have your data and you want to send it to Bob, yes. But while you are sending it to Bob, this is your data. Let's say this is your data. You 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 get another signal here on top of this, and this signal is designed in based on the channel of Bob, and it has interference. It it's directly using the same time slot, the same frequency within the same angular direction you just add a signal superimpose it a superimpose it on top of the original data signal and you combine them both and you send to the uh, you send to the receiver now both of them receive this interference and nobody is able to decode his signal successfully 
So what will happen, Bob will ask the transmitter, please resend the signal again. I couldn't decode the message. I'm not able to decode the bits. So this is uh, this is in round one. Round two, the receiver sends another packet, which is the same. It has the same data. So this is the signal. And and this is the data, let's say X, X here, X here. This is the data X. He's sending it again, the same data, but, but with different interference. So the interference here, let's call it, uh, let's call this interference, the one I put in plaque, which is coming on, in the power domain on top of the signal. Let's call it this uh, R1. So here we have R1. R1 and here R2 and this R1 and R2, they are function of the channel of the legitimate receiver. They, they are not function of, the, they are not function of the channel of the eavesdropper. And as I told you before, while we were defining physical air security and explaining some of the terms, the channel itself serves as a fingerprint. Now, you are not using the channel to generate randomness or this. You are just exploiting the channel response in order to design a signal that can cancel only at the legitimate receiver. Because the signal is function of the channel of the legitimate receiver. So what you do R, R here is function of something random. You are free. You call it A. And, and there is H. There is also H, H pop one. And this, the second signal, is function of A also, or something, uh, a function of a random variable, and uh, also function of channel P, but in the second round, so you call it HP2. And you design these mathematically and so intelligently that they will cancel at the receiver side. And this is a solution, ultimate solution to all the cases in which Eve can be located at any location, whether farther from the base station compared to Bob, or in the same location more or less, or closer to the base station, or even within the same direction of the beam, which makes these techniques, uh, of course it's not one technique, it's a it's, it's, it's bunch of techniques, many techniques, you can play with them based on your requirements, makes this technique really superior. A really amazing and great technique to to really achieve good secrecy even in the most difficult challenging cases so this is intelligent artificial signal injections the signal does not necessarily need to be gaussian or pernally or that you can design it the way you like it's a new degree of freedom that can in top of adding security, you can design it to reduce peak to average power ratio, to reduce out of band emission, to reduce interference, to reduce dispersion. It's not only providing security. And this, these kind of designs, these kind of uh, schemes are desirable. Why? Because they, they don't just provide security, but also they provide some other advantages, which make them really more, more beneficial if somebody wants to evaluate their overall benefits compared to the cost that they cause to the system. And that's awesome. That's pretty uh, acceptable and desirable in communication systems. So this is what we are working with uh, our students and in our team, designing signals that, that can really provide security for the most challenging and tough cases. But now a smart guy now might ask me and say, OK, this is just for downlink. Here we are doing downlink transmission. And downlink, in the case of downlink, downlink, usually you have a base station with so many antennas and you can beamform the signal, you can really add noise, you can. But what if I, I want to secure the uplink and the uplink is coming from a low complexity Internet of Things device here. Uh, replace a normal user with IoT who has only one antenna, who cannot do combination, who cannot do anything like this. How do you secure the transmission in the uplink? So this is another challenging scenario. 
Yes, think of that. Can, can, cannot just Eve, cannot just Bob, the Internet of Things Bob, get the data and send it as is without encrypting it, without adding any physical air security or whatever, so that we make sure that the battery of the Internet of Things device can last for a very long period of time and the resources can last uh, forever if possible, at least for 10 years or 20, and I don't need to do any of these complex operations like encryption and physical layer security. And uh, But the physical layer security is applied from, from the base station. So that's possible, that's possible, and this is a, a, a research direction we are working together with some of my students. We are addressing and focusing on providing solutions for the case of an Internet of Things device desiring to communicate with the base station and we need to make sure that the Internet of Things doesn't do anything but still he can send his data successfully or he can do some little things which are acceptable within the complexity available at its side. But this is another challenging thing in the uplink scenario. We have techniques for this. Some of them are patented. Some of them are uh, still writing patents related to them because this this is what physical air security is meant to be. Is meant to address the Internet of Things solution. We yes, of course, when you have powerful base station, you can do anything you want. But what if you have a low complexity device? What are you gonna do? And this is what we are doing. So here, back to the presentation. So here we have another figure where we have uh, for the case of fading where we have two different bit error rates or for two, two, two users here we have Bob and Eve at the same distance from the base station but one of them is experiencing good fading and the other is experiencing bad fading. So we can see that there is a security gap, security region between them. So here you have you have some gap between them and this is basically the gap here. So what, what does this mean? This means that suppose you are sending a video, video communication, yes? Let's say this is the line and you, you send uh, VoIP, VoIP communication, voice over IP, voice over IP, let's say it requires 10 to minus 2 bit error rate and this 10 to minus 2. This means that if this Bob, this the solid line is Bob and the uh, dashed line is Eve, and here Bob, Bob can achieve this, can get 10 to minus 2 at SNR equal to, let's say, 15, while Eve needs an SNR equal to 20 to achieve the same bit error rates. Yes, the bit error rate here, this is the point. Focus with me, this is the point. This is just focus here. This is the point at which the legitimate receiver pop starts getting an SNR equal to 15, which is sufficient enough to get reliable voice communication. Whereas Eve gets his, get, uh, at that point Eve, the SNR of Eve is 15. Yes, it's 15, but due to fading, he's in a deep fade region. Due to this, the bit error rate is 10 to minus 1. It's here. For Eve is here. Eve needs a signal to noise ratio equal to 20 dB so that he can reach to the same bit error rate as Bob. So to, to prevent Eve from reaching the level in which he can decode the VoIP service correctly, the Bob receiver asks the base station, tells him, look, I now can I have just enough SNR to decode the VoIP service? Please keep the transmit power of my signal at just 15 dB. Don't increase it any single dB extra. So what does this mean? This means that Bob, by instructing the transmitter, by instructing the access point or the base station, he's telling the base station, don't come to this region anymore. Don't increase the SNR anymore. I am happy, I'm okay, I'm receiving my signal successfully. Don't increase anymore so that Eve will not be able to decode the VoIP message. He will just keep getting interrupted call, noisy call, and not getting the, not hearing the communication clearly and keep complaining. 
so this is this is the scenario I'm explaining it to you. I'm explaining this scenario to you, and I believe this is really, really very practical and useful uh, way of thinking uh, of thinking about security gap, especially when you link the link ac the x axis here with the distance from the base station here and here. This is basically the SNR contains information about the path loss, the distance. It doesn't include information about the fading. The fading, the fading effect, the fading uh, uh, is embedded. The fading performance is embedded within the bit error rate curve. So this is why it's so important and critical that you get sense out of this. So now we can continue see what we have here. So here is another awesome technique for providing security where you have two cases. You have the you, you have um, you have a case where you are not sending any signal any, any artificial signal any noise and a case where you have signal or noise. So look at the first case and see what we can do. Here we have the case where we don't have artificial where we don't have artificial signal, and this is the case where we have artificial signal, artificial noise. So in the first case, as you can see, we have Bob here, Bob. This is Bob, HB, the channel of Bob, and this is HE, the channel of Eve. And we have a, a signal X, which is the signal space in the signal space, and we want to transmit it to Bob and Eve. And of course, when you send the signal, the, sig the signal gets multiplied by X, the, the channel gets multiplied by H, and this is the projection of the signal in the direction of Bob. So the received signal YP at, at the net receiver Bob, it will be the projection of this signal, original signal, on the direction of the channel HWHB. So this is the direction. And for Eve, Eve, since Eve is located in a different location, he will have different channel response and accordingly different vector, dif different channel vector. And when you multiply X by HE, you will get a different projection, which is the, uh, since you multiply X the data by HE, you will get the projection of H on the direction of HE and you get a different received signal vector. So overall, you still have a signal received at Eve and Bob, and this is random, dependent on the fading in the channel. But what if you want to really kill the reception of Eve and make sure that he will never get any, he will never get his data pure. It will always, uh, we, we, we want Eve to always get some interference. So in this case, what happened, and if you look at the right hand side of the figure, part B, you can see that we have here, we have the, we have the signal X, and along, along with signal X, we are adding interference signal. And this interference signal, we call it A. A represents an artificial noise signal. We add it very smartly at the transmitter in such a way that it comes exactly orthogonal and perpendicular to the transmitted vector X, the information vector X, so that it doesn't harm X. What's the projection of an orthogonal vector on any vector? It's going to be zero. So the contribution of the noise, the effect of the noise on the original data signal X is going to be exactly zero, which means that although you are adding noise to your data while you are transmitting it, but since this noise is exactly embedded in the knowledge space of the channel of the legitimate receiver, which means it's orthogonal to the channel vector of the legitimate receiver, it will not harm Bob at all. It will only harm Eve, whose channel is different from Bob's channel. And the null that's calculated based on Bob's channel will not be exactly the same as Eve. And if from just one round, one round, you don't need many rounds, just one round, you will make sure that the, 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 the signal that you add, the artificial signal you added during your transmission will harm both, but it will not harm Eve.
And in this case, you don't need encryption. You don't need any. Uh, this is a technique that can provide very good security without the need to use any encryption. It really secure your data very good. But the, 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 since this technique is dependent on the channel and the channel is random and it requires some processing and the, you are not sure sometimes the channel of pop and eve if the channel is line of sight and you don't have much randomness and they are in the same direction, this technique cannot work and it will be hard to achieve security. But there are cases which are most of the cases you are always having rich scattering channel in wireless environment and this will work nicely and they provide security. Why? Because now look look at A. If you take the projection of A on the direction of HE, you, what will you get? You will get this and this will be added on top of the signal that's received at, OB, at EVE as interference. This is interference. Now let's look at the received signal at EVE. The received signal at EVE is HE multiplied by X plus HE multiplied by A. H, E, and A, this term does not cancel. This is not zero. This is not zero. This term remains as is. Whereas this term, when it gets A, when A gets multiplied by H, B, it will be zero at the, in the direction of the estimate receiver. This is magic. This is very beautiful. So as you can see here, our there are eyes here. This is what Bob E sees, and this is what Eve, this is what Eve sees, and this is what Bob. So basically, Bob here, Bob sees only this HP multiplied by X without any contribution from X, but while Eve sees HE multiplied by X plus HE multiplied by A. And here we are considering the case where the transmitter has only two antennas. So this X carrying two information, like carry it's two by one vector multiplied by the channel, which is one by two, two by two goes, it remains one. So this is one information symbol. And this technique can only happen when the transmitter has more number of antennas than the receiver. That's a very important thing to remember. Otherwise, this technique will not work, will not function. Uh, this is a, a condition, a prerequisite for this technique to function properly. So this is a very awesome, nice technique as well that I need you to understand it and uh, be, uh, understand not only the math of it, but also the, 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 the sense that like the meaning of it and how this happens and the projection of the vectors and how these things can be seen from the perspective of Eve and Bob and different different angles. Now I think we can stop here for now. I want you to just have enough time to digest these techniques, repeat the lecture multiple times because this is one of the most important lectures in terms of technical knowledge, in terms of uh, the why, answering the different cases, uh, different scenarios and wh what techniques you need to use to provide security. And do you really need always sophisticated technique to provide security? All these are really significant and important part of the physical layer security domain. And uh, those examples are basics. They are not all the examples in the literature, but most of the other techniques and this, they are combination of them or derived from them. There are some other techniques we didn't discuss. We will discuss them next lecture. But for now, these are the key core techniques in physical layer security and they are explained from the perspective of why, why I need them, and perspective of where Eve is located and the problem that exists that was exi that was exist existing in the literature because physical air security when it emerged and it really start started in 1975 and there was the assumption that to make sure that it works Eve has to experience bad channel and this can come only when Eve is far from the base station and which makes it impractical because I cannot be sure that Eve is always far from the base station but when with the design of super signal superimposition uh, signal uh, artificial signal injection and the two techniques I explained to you the lot at the lot at the end of the lecture those are the practical techniques that can really they provide security even for the cases where Eve has better SNR than Bob. Because you can add something that can degrade Eve's performance and make it worse. 
So with this, we conclude our lecture and finish and we stop here and we can continue in next lecture with other parts and giving you some other examples related to physical layer security. So thank you everybody for your time and for being with us and take care, stay blessed and see you in the next lecture.